in the last few lessons, we have discussed the scientific revolution and the impact that this revolution had on the world and on humankind. We saw that the last 500 years have witnessed a breathtaking series of changes. The Earth has been united into a single economic and historical sphere. The economy has grown exponentially, and humankind today enjoys the kind of wealth that used to be the stuff of fairy tales. Science and, industrial and the Industrial Revolution have given humankind superhuman powers and practically limitless energy. The social order has been completely transformed, as have been politics, daily life, and human psychology. But are we happier? Did the wealth humankind accumulated over the last few centuries translate into more happiness? Did the discovery of inexhaust inexhaustible energy resources open before us inexhaustible stores of bliss? Going further back in time, we can expand this question and ask about the entire his human history, the whole 70,000 years of history. Did these 70,000 years of revolutions and changes since the cognitive revolution made the world a better place to live in? Are we today uh, happier than the uh, hunter-gatherers that lived here tens of thousands of years ago? If not, if the answer to this question is in the negative, we are not happier than uh, our ancestors. All these revolutions and changes did not, did not make the world a better place to live in then what was the benefit? What was the point about all these changes? What was the point of inventing and discovering agriculture and cities and writing and money and empires and science and industry and all that, if in the bottom line we are not happier than our ancestors? Historians seldom ask such questions. They do not ask, for example, whether the citizens of Babylon well, happier than the hunter-gatherers that lived in Mesopotamia 20,000 years ago. Historians seldom ask whether the rise of Islam made Egyptians more pleased with their lives. Historians seldom ask whether the collapse of the European empires in Africa uh, made people in Africa happier or more miserable than they were before. Yet, these are the most important questions that we can ask about history. For what could be the purpose of achieving economic growth or political freedom or social equality if it does not result in making people happier? Now, if you have studied seriously, in a scientific way, the long-term history of happiness, but almost every scholar and layperson has some vague preconception about the history of happiness. One common view points out that human power, human capabilities, have increased dramatically throughout history. Since humans usually use their power to alleviate miseries and to fulfill their aspirations, it follows, according to this view, that we, who have much more power than our ancestors, we must be happier than our medieval ancestors, and they, in turn, must have been happier than, say, Stone Age hunter-gatherers. But this progressive view of the history of happiness is not very convincing. As we have seen many times during this course, more power and new kinds of behaviors and skills do not necessarily make life better and happier. For example, when humans learned how to farm during the agricultural revolution, the collective power of humankind to shape the environment and to control what is happening in the world definitely increased. Humans were far more powerful after the agricultural revolution. But the fate 
the living condition, the daily life of individual humans after the agricultural revolution was in many respects worse than previously. Peasants had to work harder than foragers and received in return a less nutritious diet. Peasants were far more exposed to disease and to exploitation and to social stratification from their hunter-gatherer ancestors. So the agricultural revolution, it definitely increased the power of humankind, but not necessarily its happiness. Similarly, this is not the only example. Another example is the rise and spread of the European empires in the modern age. The spread of the European empires certainly increased the collective power of humankind by circulating ideas, circulating technologies and crops, and opening new avenues of commerce and industry. Yet, all these developments and changes, and all this growing power of humanity, was hardly good news for the tens of millions of Africans and Native Americans and Aboriginal Australians who found themselves uh, uh, enslaved by the Europeans. Given the proven human tendency to misuse power, not to use power to the best ends, it seems very, very naive to believe that there is a direct line leading from power to happiness, that the more power humankind has, the, the happier it must be, and therefore the increase in human power throughout history must have been accompanied by an increase in happiness. It's very, very naive to think along such lines. Some critics of this positive view take actually a diametrically opposed position. They argue that there is not a positive correlation between power and happiness, there is actually an inverse correlation between power and happiness. Power corrupts. As humankind gained more and more power through history, it created a very cold, mechanistic world which is ill-suited for the real needs of, uh, of Homo sapiens. Evolution, according to this view, molded, shaped our minds and bodies for the life of hunter-gatherers. The transition, first to agriculture and later on to industry, actually condemned human beings to live unnatural lives that cannot give full expression to our inherent instincts and cannot satisfy our deepest yearnings and needs. Life may be very comfortable today, but nothing in the comfortable life of the urban middle class can approach the wild excitement and the sheer joy experienced by a forager band on a successful mammoth hunt. This is a romantic view of history. Yet, this romantic insistence on seeing the dark side of every invention and every, and every development in history is as dogmatic as the belief in the inevitability of progress. Yes, it is true that perhaps today we are out of touch with our inner hunter-gatherer, but it's not all bad. All the developments of history were not necessarily all of them bad. For example, over the last two centuries, modern medicine has decreased child mortality from about 33% to less than 5%. Can anyone, can anyone seriously doubt that this made a huge contribution to the happiness not only of those children who would otherwise have died from diseases, but also to the happiness of their parents and families and friends? A third position about, a third common position about the long-term history of happiness takes a middle road. It argues that until the scientific revolution, there was indeed no clear correlation between power and happiness. Medieval people 
may indeed have been more miserable than our hunter-gatherer ancestors tens of thousands of years ago. But, according to this position, in the last few centuries, after the scientific revolution, or during the scientific revolution, humans have finally learned how to use their power more wisely. The triumphs of modern medicine are just one example of this. Other unprecedented achievements of humankind following or during the uh, scientific revolution include the steep decline in violence and the virtual disappearance of international wars, which we discussed in the previous lesson, and also the near elimination of large-scale famine. There are fewer and fewer people, uh, on average, that die today from starvation and famine. So this is a middle, a middle uh, approach to the history of happiness. Yes, until the scientific revolution, increase in power did not lead to uh, increase in happiness, but science has given us the ability, the wisdom, to finally link power and happiness, and in the last few decades and centuries, an increase in power does indeed cause a significant increase in human happiness. Yet this too is an oversimplification. First, because this view bases its optimistic assessment of the modern age on actually a very small sample of years. The majority of humans began to enjoy the successes of modern medicine no earlier than 1850. And the drastic drop in child mortality is a 20th century phenomenon. It's only a phenomenon of the last 100 years. Mass famines continued to plague much of humanity until the middle of the 20th century. <clears throat> International wars too became rare, as we saw in the last lesson, only after 1945, largely thanks to the new threat of complete nuclear annihilation. Hence, even if uh, the last few decades have been some kind of unprecedented golden age for humanity, this is a very short time, and it is too early to know whether this represents a fundamental shift in the currents of history, or an ephemeral wave of good fortune. Secondly, the second problem with this over-optimistic view of, modern, of the modern age is that even if this brief golden age of the last half century uh, uh, was very good for us, it may have been during this period that we sowed the, we sow the seeds of future catastrophe. Over the last few decades, with all our good fortune, we've also been disturbing the, eco the ecological equilibrium of our planet in numerous new ways uh, with what is likely to be very difficult and dangerous consequences for ourselves. There is a lot of evidence indicating that we are destroying over the last few decades the very basis for human prosperity in a kind of orgy of reckless consumption. So this golden age of the last few decades, what, what's happening is that maybe we are experiencing very good years, but we will be paying for them a very, very high price in the next decades and century. Nobody really knows what are going to be the consequences of the dramatic ecological disturbances that we are responsible for in, 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 in this age. Uh, finally, another reason to, uh, uh, to be cautious about this over-optimistic view of modernity is that we can congratulate ourselves on the unprecedented accomplishment of modern homo sapiens only if we completely ignore the fate of all other animals. Much of the material wealth that shield us today against disease and famine was accumulated at the expense of laboratory monkeys and dairy cows and millions and billions of conveyor belt chickens. Tens of billions of such animals have been subjected over the last two centuries to a regime of industrial exploitation 
uh, whose cruelty has no precedent in the annals of planet Earth. If we accept even just a tenth of what animal rights activists are saying, then modern industrial agriculture may well turn out to be the greatest crime in the history, which caused massive suffering. When we come to evaluate global happiness, it is of course wrong to count only the happiness of, say, the upper classes, or only the happiness of Europeans, or only the happiness of men, and not take into account the happiness of, say, women or Africans. Perhaps it is also wrong to uh, consider only the happiness of humans when we try to assess global happiness levels and forget all about the happiness or suffering of other animals. So these are the problems with this third option of uh, uh, viewing modernity as an era in which happiness really began to rise to, thanks to the rise in, in, in human power. Another problem with all the views which we have discussed so far is that they discuss happiness largely as a product of material factors such as your health, your diet, your wealth, and so forth. If people are richer and healthier, according to this approach, then they must also be happier. But is this really so obvious? Philosophers and priests and poets throughout history have thought about the nature of happiness and the causes of happiness. And many of the greatest minds of humankind for the last centuries and millennia came to the conclusion that social and ethical and spiritual factors have as great an impact on our happiness as material conditions. Now, nobody could argue with the fact that the material condition of people, at least today, are much better than in the past. But if happiness depends not only on material condition, but also on social and spiritual factors and so forth, so it doesn't necessarily mean that we are happier than our ancestors. Perhaps people in modern affluent societies suffer greatly from alienation and meaninglessness despite their prosperity. And perhaps our less well-to-do ancestors did manage to find a lot of contentment and joy in community relations, in religion, in a bond with nature, and things like that. We will try to tackle these questions in the next segment that will be dedicated to understanding different theories about what really makes people happy and how these theories reflect upon human history and the history of happiness.